My name is Charlie Scammell and uh, I'm a relative newcomer to Stanton having lived in or around this town only since 1959. I was inspired to do this DVD for, for three reasons. First is my general interest in history. Second is I've always been fascinated by this town and how Stanton has remained relatively unchanged for over a hundred years. Unlike the rest of New Jersey, Stanton retains a lot of its mid-19th century rustic rural character. And thirdly and most importantly is I wanted to capture the stories of the people that grew up around here before they are lost in time. Growing up I was the beneficiary of hearing many of these stories and I recognized only recently that soon many of these people who knew this information will be gone. So I'll be successful with this DVD if I'm able to capture some of their stories and some of their memories. What you're going to hear today are excerpts of interviews I did in the summer of 2008. You're going to hear one historian and you're going to hear stories from several individuals who have lived in or around Stanton since before 1940. There were many other individuals I wanted to interview but some of them were not well enough to be interviewed, others were not available, and that's our loss. You're going to hear stories about what it was like growing up here, the role of the church, the role of the store, industry as it existed in the 1920s and 1930s, their friends, and how they grew up here in Stanton. Also, we're going to ask them why they stayed and what has made this place so special. These are their history and their memories. I hope you enjoy Stanton Stories. Well, my name is Chester Hall. My name is Henry R. Dillon. My name is Ann Scomp Sauerland. My name is Stephanie Stevens. My name is Cora Landon. My name is Shirley Simerson. I was Landon daughter of Charles and Cora Landon. My name is uh, Ryman Hurd, Jr. My name is Mike Alfano. I'm Carlton Durling. I was born in Stanton in 1915. I was born in 1923. I was born in Reddington Township on the farm in 1929. I was born on a farm up here on Stanton Mountain Road where the Hotsas live now. My husband and I have been married 71 years ago today. I've lived in uh, my house uh, for all of my life. My family has lived in that, on that property since the late 1890s, so we have roots that go way back. My family, they were from Stanton too. My father's family, as far as I uh, have a record, back to the mid-1700s, and his family lived mostly all up over Stanton Mountain Road. And my parents, moved out to uh, the house that I'm living in now in 19, approximately 1925. Born in 1926, my family moved from Flemington to uh, Stanton in the mid-1930s. I have an interest in the history of Stanton and I'm researching the people and the places in Stanton. I'm the historian for Hunterdon County and for many years I was the historian for Reddington Township where I wrote many books about the history of this township. What was it like growing up here as a child? Very uneventful, you know. There was no great happenings in those days. Uh, uh, the kids mostly had uh, work to do as they were, they were big enough to do anything. Well, there was a lot of freedom, you know. It isn't like, th this is a pretty tight society nowadays. You can't go on other people's property. And uh, so we used to walk to see our friends through other people's properties, and you can't do that anymore. When I was kids, I used to walk to the Stanton store to get chocolate. They used to cut off pieces of chocolate and the kids would walk miles to go to the Stanton store to get that. In those days, if you didn't, this is what's wrong with the kids nowadays. You, if you want something, you had to go out and get a job and, and make the money to buy it, you know? 
that's not, I don't think they teach the kids that now. Most of us, when we were, you know, get to be 10 years old, we had little jobs. I know when I was 10, I worked all summer on a farm down the road when I, my dad didn't need me and, uh, for a dollar a day. And I worked all summer. I made, uh, I remember $27 and I sent to Montgomery Ward for a bicycle. <laughs> And that's the only bicycle I ever had. But and most kids had little jobs to do, you know. And even if they didn't have jobs that paid any money, they had plenty of work to do at home, you know. I had my chores. I collected eggs from about a thousand chickens, and I, I collected eggs every day and had to feed them. And then I would carry milk from from the barn to the milk house and in big pails and pour it through the filters into the into the big cans, and then my father would take it over to the Dairyman's Lake. When I got up here, uh, my parents did not like groundhogs because the riding horse or the farm horse had got his foot in it, and a hole could end up breaking the leg and, and be finished. And I was sent out with a single shot 22 to uh, reduce the groundhog population, and nobody thought anything about it. I think they'd be horrified now if somebody nine or ten were uh, sent out with a with a rifle. But that was just uh, we were still kind of in the frontier age. I know one kid came to school with me. I wouldn't say he was a pretty big fellow. He used to bring his shotgun to school, and he would hunt on the way home. And they farmed 500 acres there. They had uh, 40 head of cows. They used to milk by hand. And uh, they just uh, were just working most of the time, <laughs> working out in the fields and stuff until they got older. My dad would go down to work in the graveyard, mow the grass and so forth. I would go with him when I was little and clip around the headstones, you know, for $3. Another job I had was to go around with a uh, old Model A Ford and tow chestnut logs out of the mountain so that they could be made into posts and rails. And they didn't have much time to play, but when they did, why well, we played the ordinary games, you know. And uh, we went on hiking and fishing, and when we got bigger, we had little baseball teams and so forth. I enjoyed living around here. The people were always nice to me. Being I was the only child, everybody in the, in the town would kind of look after me, you know, make sure, because my mom and dad both worked. I think it, it, it shaped people to be better citizens. Yeah. Also, we didn't have the influence of uh, television and so forth. That some of it is bad influence, I think. We played wherever we could, you know. There was a field that wasn't mowed or something. You know, usually back here was uh, where the old schoolhouse was, and across the road, and then the field next door, which would be right behind here, we used to play baseball. Every little community had a baseball team, you know, and. Uh, if we were lucky enough, we'd get Saturday afternoons off and uh, play baseball. And uh, we had a tennis court uh, where the uh, parking lot is now. We made a tennis court, all the bigger ones. One thing that kept me away from uh, uh, some areas of New York and, and Brooklyn and, and um, um, uh, you know, in New Jersey, where bad things go on, People out, out here didn't have those thoughts about, you know, getting free money from somebody walking down the street. It just didn't work that way. The beginnings of Stanton really did not take place on this hill. The beginnings of Stanton were down by the river where there was a mill and there was a whole village down there. We now call it Rowland's Mill area, and there, it was along what is now Route 31. But eventually the, the establishment moved up the hill. They were on about 100 acre farms, and there were only a few families, and they intermarried quite a bit, which makes it very interesting to try to track down the, uh, the genealogy of the place. It's families like the Newells, uh, Housel, the Mott, um, Fonger or Fonner. Housel was so prominent that the place was called Housel's. 
Names in uh, colonial America really designated who lived there and what they were doing there. And so this was called Housel's. Housel himself was German. And he was very typical of the, the Germans who settled along what was called the West Jersey Society's line, which runs right through Stanton. Now by the 1830s, we then have a change because people here went to the Reddington Dutch Reformed Church. They were, except for Housels, who went to the German Baptist Church, these people who started to come in here were Dutch, and their affiliation was the Reddington Dutch Reformed Church. The 1830s is really when you had villages come into being. They decided to call it Mount Pleasant. And so the incorporation of the church is the incorporation of the Dutch Reformed Church of Mount Pleasant. Well, as time went on and people started to infill these various lots, almost all of the houses here along what we call the Stanton Road were built in the 1830s. And we have this lovely Greek Revival type architecture along the way here. And here we have the, the, as I say, the beginning of the village. The store came in in the 1830s. The church came in in 1833. And you just had people building up around here. Contrary to uh, common belief, Stanton was mostly settled by German immigrants, not Dutch. For example, the, the first stone house was built by Housel. And it's an example of German architecture, not Dutch. Mostly you can tell that because the stone goes up all the way to the top instead of just the first two stories like a Dutch house would typically have. The Housel House is a bank house, which is pretty common in this area because the terrain is mostly hilly. And it had some advantages in terms of heating in the winter and cooling in the summer and, and the like. The bank houses were oftentimes built into the side of the hill so that the bottom floor would actually not be uh, accessible from the front of the house. It was Mount Pleasant for many, many, many years until they decided they wanted a post office of their own so they wouldn't have to go so far to Rollins Mills to get their mail. So they applied to the United States Postal Service who then came back and said, sorry, we already have a Mount Pleasant post office in Hunterdon County. In the late 18, 1840s, uh, Stanton got a post office, what became Stanton. Originally, it was run by um, Reiner Rollins from Rollins Mills, and that was in 1848, and he called the post office Williamsburg. Eventually, they came up with the name Stanton. Many people over the years have said, oh, it was named for Lincoln's Secretary of War, whose name was Stanton. Well, that's not possible because this name change took place in 1849. In 1849, John Wirt, who owned the general store, became the postmaster. And that's when the name of the town became Stanton after the, because the post office was named Stanton Post Office. My theory is that some of the land that was owned along the West Jersey Society's line was owned by James Logan. James Logan was secretary to William Penn. He was a colleague of Benjamin Franklin. He was one of the founders of the University of Pennsylvania. He owned vast quantities of land out here and right along the society's line through what would be Upper Stanton up around the mountain. At that time, his home in Philadelphia was called Stenton. However, I have read it in deeds in Hunterdon County, deeds where out here we spelled it Stanton. Agriculture predominated in this area and in this township. Everybody here was a farmer. Of course, most of them were farmers around, but in the village why there was, of course, Ben Boyce with a store, and uh, there were a couple of uh, masons and carpenters, and there was a carpet maker and the Ardwins. They had knitting machines, and they used to knit socks and sweaters and stuff for the New York trade. 
And then John Painter up here in the corner where that big house is, he had a pigeon farm. He used to raise squabs for the New York trade. They would dress them, you know, take them down to the train and ship them to New York. Stanton itself, the whole village, was the center of a rural area. It was where you could send your children to school. It was where you went to church. It was where you went to the general store to purchase things that you didn't have on the farm. Um, by the 1830s and, and a little bit later than that, we were finding that you could buy material in the store to make your own clothing. Uh, previous to that, you had to spin your own linen and your own wool and make your own clothing. Also, you could buy shoes. Um, eventually, instead of doing your own butchering, you could send your um, cows and pigs and, and farm animals to be butchered here in Stanton by a butcher. Saving lots of time and maybe spending a little more money, but then again, as you got on past the Industrial Revolution, people then were expecting to purchase goods. Stanton is the site of the first artificially inseminated cow born in the United States. Probably the most exciting thing that ever took, ever took place from an agrarian point of view in Stanton was the birth of the first artificially inseminated calf, and that took place up on the Scomp Farm. From Denmark and other places, I learned how to do this. My family had a, a role in the uh, development of artificial insemination in the, in the country. There was um, some competition among the local farmers um, about who would actually get to have the first calf born, and fortunately, I guess for my father, um, that calf was born on our farm. It was probably in the agricultural world, it was like sending a man to the moon at that time. It completely changed the agricultural uh, end of the bovine end of agriculture. It was just a world-shattering event. And it happened right here in Stanton. I, I think one of the big changes in Stanton was the fact they paved all the roads. When did they put the gas station in across the street? That was about in the early 20s. Uh, Lee Cole was our mechanic of the Model T Ford. He uh, started out in the stone house down there in that garage. And uh, if you look at that garage, you can see where the stone has been laid in, where there was a, a door there. And then he moved it up to I think it's the same building that uh, these people over here use as a guest house but, and fixed it all up. And then he moved over here and, and built this place. And uh, part of it was a garage, and then he had three or four rooms around the side where they lived. And then later on, he turned it all into a garage when they moved the barn over from here to uh, to the place over there. It was, must have been a, about 19... 21. I know my dad had a 1917 Model T and he got gas there and so did everybody else. I had a car. He used to run the bus and I think one of the reasons they had the, the pump was to keep the bus filled up, you know. Gas station was here when I came and it was uh, the official uh, one was Louise Cole. Uh, because rumor had it that her husband uh, had some uh, depression debts and, and didn't want to get too much in his name. But it was standard oil. You get for a buck, you get five, five, a little over five gallons. And our farm trucks are always fueled there. There's a, a lot of dairy farms operated in the Reddington area three bridges and uh and they would bring their milk into our plant uh on the horse and buggy and uh in the winter uh they use sleds a lot stan was fortunate enough to have a resident doctor by 1841. he came from amwell his name was henry kirkpatrick and he was in stan for about 10 years but he died young and then um Dr. Kreveling, William Sloan Kreveling, who came from Bethlehem, Jugtown Mountain, uh, became a doctor in Stanton. And he was there for quite a while, but then he decided to retire and move back to Bethlehem. And he's, I guess he sold the practice to Albert Shannon, who then married 
Grumbling's daughter. Shannon lived about 10 years as a doctor there, and then he died early. And the house was empty for about a, a year or two. Who was the doctor back in? Uh... Dr. Johnson. Frederick Lincoln Johnson moved into Stanton. He had previously been a doctor in White House in Reddington, came from a long line of doctors uh, in White House, Reddington, and um, Three Bridges. He uh, delivered all four of my, of, our, of my family. He used to charge $10 for delivering 15 if he had to use forceps. And uh, he was quite a character. I mean, he was kind of a, a, a caustic old fellow. He wasn't, wasn't like you see in, the, in these Norman Rockwell pictures. But uh, he used to pull teeth, and he would set broken bones, and, and everything that people needed, you know. He'd supply medicine because there was no pharmacies around. There had been a doctor here named Johnson before my time. And, and the uh, legend about him was, he said, uh, you keep busy, sleep when you're dead. But I don't, I wish I had known uh, him. I remember one time, my, my dad used to drive him around once in a while. And <clears throat> they were delivered a baby down around Reddington someplace. And, and on the way home at night, they stopped in to see if the lady was making out all right. And they found the baby sitting on the oven door, you know, and she was out in the field husking corn. And he was the doctor in Stanton from about 1890 to the early 1920s. Healthcare was a joke. In those days, uh, of course, he furnished all the medicine there was, but in those days, people depended a lot on herbs. I know a lady up on the mountain near Ryman Hurst place used to go out in the fall and gather all kinds of herbs and she would hang them up in the shed, and then in the wintertime when people got sick, they would all go up to Aunt Jane, you know, and get medicine. She would tell them what they do and so forth. And the doctor recommended it in many cases, because you didn't go to the doctor to be with a horse and wagon. That was a big trip to go to Flemington. Most people didn't have horses anyway. And if you were needed a hospital, there was none around except Easton. You had to go to Easton. Of course, that was by train and uh, they didn't run trains for emergencies. Their medicine was almost akin to the um, alternate medicine that we have now. You know, that alternate medicine has some bearing to it because that's what they used when I was a little boy. Of course, most of his, his work was on the road with his horse and buggy, you know, and uh, uh, I think later on he used a car, but he never drove himself. And uh, he, uh, he would make his rounds, and uh, wherever he happened to be, they say at noon he would stop in and have lunch. I know he ate with me one time when my father or my mother was sick. I came home from school, and there he was in the dining room eating lunch, you know. And uh, he, he was... Uh, he was never very good at, at, at uh, business. He, he loved his his patients, but most of all, he loved his chickens. But uh, it was hard to get money out of him. It was hard to pay him. I know my dad said when, when he died, uh, he still owed for the four kids, you know, and uh, he could never pay him. And so he went to Mrs. Johnson and asked him, and, and she said, well, that was a trouble with everybody. She said she sent a, a bill to check Roach, the White House, for medical services. And he sent back a bigger bill for meals. And uh, so anyway, she settled with my father for a load of corn for the chickens. So you can call that uh, Medicare Part B <laughs> in those days, I guess. We had a very early school in Stanton. Going to a one-room schoolhouse was a lot of fun. School was a lot different than the school. You can see it had two entrances. So one on the left was the girls' entrance, and the one on the right was the boys' entrance, and we didn't share cloak rooms or anything. The girls went in one side, and the boys went in another side, and interestingly enough, they still ended up in the same classroom, so one has to question that. Most kids didn't start the school till they were six or seven years old because, you know, they walked from long distances. They came from Stanton Station, they came from Woods Church Road, they came from uh, Kate Bell came from down uh, across uh, 523. I had to walk a mile to school every morning, rain or shine, and back. 
their parents just didn't walk with them because, you know, they were busy too and they had other kids at home, so you couldn't take a kid, you know, th five years old and, and walk that distance. So they were, they were bigger kids that came to school. Then you could come on your bicycle. Occasionally I'd bring my horse down, try it, tie it to the tree. There wasn't that many children there. It was uh, the one family that used to go there had 16 in the family. So being the only child, I just loved it because I had someone to play with. One through to eight grades all in one room. And it was taught by Mrs. Bushfield, the one teacher, you know. It was quite a feat. So a lot of the big boys didn't come only in the wintertime, you know, because their fathers, uh, their, they needed them on the farm. They would come like from uh, Thanksgiving till maybe uh, the 1st of April, and then they would disappear. And the school then would jump down from maybe 25 or 30 kids to maybe 15. And a lot of them, of course, never graduated. There were probably close to 30. One teacher, she taught every subject to every kid. There were, there were four of us in my grade, Then we frequently would have the desks like two and two facing each other, so we were one little group. So we all had our desks with the inkwell. I know when I went to school, we had shared desks, and I was about so big, you know, and this guy that sat next to me was like this, you know, he was about <laughs> 16 years old, you know. And that's the way it was in those days. It was all, all ages would come, you know. One room school was a big room with a coal uh, stove in the uh, one end, the coal scuttle, and the teacher would throw coal in periodically. We started out by the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, you know, and then uh, the Mrs. Bushfield could play the organ, and we would often sing America the Beauty for something, you know, before the school started. And uh, there was four rooms in the school. There was a, a kitchen, which once in a while we would make cocoa or something. A little book room off in the back where the textbooks were stored that weren't in use at the time. And then there was a side room, a library room, which had uh, many uh, uh, National Geographics, which were a main interest to the boys because they had advertisements for the cars for years back. And there was a cob room where they kept corn cobs, a big stack of corn cobs, which they used to start the fire. And when we were need discipline, we were bad when she would send us into the cob room. And we'd have to sit there and cool. It was cold in there too, you know, no heat for, for a while until we straightened out. That was one of our punishments. And they had no inside plumbing. We had outside bathrooms. Uh, one nasty for the boys and one for the girls. I remember uh, we had these uh, outhouses and one of the little kids, I won't mention his name, but he went in the outhouse, he had a big splinter in his backside and she had to go out there and pull it out. You know? When they would get tired of, of being in school, they would climb up on the cool house roof, you know, and stuff something in the chimney and uh, would gas them out, you know, for a while. And if, uh, if they wanted to do a good job, they'd put a dead animal down there, too, you know. Things were rough with him. They would slap your hands with their rulers, you know, and so forth. But they never did that when I went to school. Uh, in the wintertime, it was kind of cold, because uh, each side of the, of the schoolhouse, one side the boys went in, the other side the girls went in. And if your boots or coats were wet, that's the way they were when you come out, because there was no heat in those little rooms but there was a big stove. It wasn't very good. They, uh, the room was never very warm. They, Mrs. Bushfield, who taught our school when I was there, lived down in the stone house where Henry Hunt lived. Uh, she used to have to come up mornings real early or her husband, if he was home, would come up and stoke the fire, you know, and uh, try to get it going. It was a wood fire, which would uh, if we were lucky, it would turn into a coal fire. And the kids would have to, the bigger ones would have to bring in the wood and the coal and so forth. And on real cold days, she would bring us up all around the stove, you know. And it was real gassy at times. You'd have to use the windows open. But, and we used to <laughs> wear our clothes most of the time, you know. And we had like a little library that had no heat at all. 
So if you wanted a book, you better know where it's at before you go in there because it was cold. The kids would be called up to sit around the teacher, you know, when they're when their grade was called, and they would sit in benches around it and make their recitations and go to the blackboard and do their their math and so forth. And uh, uh, you got a pretty good education just by sitting there listening to the others, you know, because you could hear the eighth grade when you were in the fourth, you know. And but as I recall, you know, you learned a lot from listening to the older kids. So my class never went to second grade because we had completed all the second grade work by the time we finished first grade. So we, we literally skipped second grade and went on to third grade. I know when I graduated, there were only four of us left, two boys and two girls. And in those days, you had to go to Flemington and take a test at the grammar school before they would allow you into high school. Oh, is that right? And if you flunked or you didn't get in, you came home and spent another year. Church in any community in early America was the centerpiece of that community. It was a, an outpost, really, of the church in Reddington. People found it just too difficult to get there. And it was an all-day episode to go to church in those days. So we find that these people then decided, well, they would have a church up here. The Dutch Reformed Church of Mount Pleasant, soon to become the Dutch Reformed Church of Stanton, as I said, was an offshoot of the Reddington Dutch Reformed Church. It was it served the people here who were Dutch. The church was the center of the community, and uh, if there were ever any meetings, you know, that uh, it was held there, and there were Wednesday nights to prayer meetings. It was the only social place there was. Probably the principal center of activity um, in the community. As a child, I went to Sunday school every Sunday and, and to church and to Bible school in the summer. And I was always in the, in the children's choir. The Ladies Guild were the backbone of the church. You know, they had their Sowbury Festival and their Harvest Homes, which uh, made money. And uh, the community all chipped in for it, you know, and uh, it kept the church afloat. I know one time the minister made $1,500 a year, you know, and the classes had to pay most of that. And it's up to the Women's Guild, to, because, you know, in your collections, you know, you might get a dollar or something like that, but not like today. Well, at that time, uh, you know, <laughs> you either believed in God or, or forget it. So uh, uh, there wasn't any independence from the church. And uh, Reverend Muller was the first one that I can remember. Reverend Nickel and his wife did a lot for this, for this, um, this area. Not so much for us, but even so, when my mother was on her deathbed, uh, even though we were Catholic, he came over to see, you know. I hear stories that sometimes on Sundays would only be five parishioners show up. There was a sad thing, uh, one occasion he went to uh, a uh, pastoral visit to a um, widow uh, that had the poultry farm on uh, at the intersection of Drayhook and Stanton Mountain Road. And somehow he didn't quite set the brake on his vehicle and it rolled and broke the poor widow's arm or leg, I forget which. At one point um, there were several of us who alternated playing the old pump organ in the, in the church, and then Henry Bomberger was working in the um, NBC studios in New York City, and they were throwing out, they were getting rid of the live um, organs that they'd had in the studios to provide background music for um, their television shows and so forth. And so um, he was able to acquire an old Hammond organ for Stanton Church, and I, th I think it was Earl Hart Pence and a couple of other men drove the truck into, into New York City and picked up this um, cigarette-stained <laughs> um, instrument, brought it out. They um, refinished it, put it in the church, and it worked for many years. Everybody in the family, in fact, all my granddaughters, 
have been married here at the Stanton Church. <laughs> Before it burned uh, in 31, uh, there used to be two bells. One would ring for the services in the morning and the other would have a smaller bell would toll when you died. And they would toll the, the years. If you were 75, they would toll seven times and then, seven, and then five more. And uh, it was, a, it was a, an oddity. I know after the ashes cooled and so forth, I and another fellow went down in the woods and dug up three maple trees and planted them. They're the ones that are there now. What are some of your memories of the store? Well, I don't think the store itself has changed much. Ben Boys came here in 1872 and he, he sold it in 1932. You bought everything you needed at the store. He, he groceries and he sold boots and shoes and overalls and dress goods and harnesses for horses and he sold some feed and you could buy almost anything. There was four stories. There was a main store and then there was two stores underneath, two rooms underneath where he kept uh, pickled pork and molasses and stuff like that. And then there was one up above where he kept hardware, you know, stovepipe and nails and, and uh, all sorts of things. Because, you know, nobody went to, to Farmington in those days. And uh, he would go once a week to town to do his banking, and if anybody wanted to ride with him, well, they could, you know, but it was, it was a chore going to town in those days. Well, for me, it was their oyster crackers. He used to have big barrels, Mr. Bloys. He used to have big barrels of all sorts of crackers and things. Stanton store was the place where you basically got a good number of your groceries at one time. They had a, an excellent meat department at one time and there was a frozen food locker in the back. The uh, uh, lockers, frozen food lockers, which was the big rage. Where you could store, because if, before people had their own home freezers, um, you could store your, your frozen meats and, and your frozen vegetables or whatever in, in this locker space that you rented. It used to be an ice house and uh, they would cut ice. Used to be a lot of ice in those days. The river used to, you know, get thick with ice, and they would cut ice, and he would fill it with sawdust, you know, and the ice would be all summer long. That was the only ice that we could get, you know. We'd make ice cream once in a while because there were no ice men, no refrigerator, no electric, you know. And so that was an ice house, and then the barn was where he kept his horse, and where the post office says uh, he used to have some feed in there. Stanton store. I remember that years ago. They used to have the post office there afterwards. It was moved twice in the store. Then Barton and Barton, then they bought it, they built onto the back and had a frozen food locker plant there. And then they moved the post office back there. That's when I helped them out. I worked in the office of the frozen food locker. George and Minnie Barton ran that. They had a Ford V8 panel truck that would deliver uh, groceries around uh, so a mother could call up as it did in Flemington and uh, uh, groceries would be uh, delivered. And then uh, I think after World War II, oh before World War II, the building which is now the post office was turned into an ice cream parlor and, and a uh, young lady named Johnson, maybe some descendant of uh, Dr. Johnson or married to one of uh, uh, some descendant, she was the uh, soda jerk. And um, we would stop there on a truck full of hay bales and uh, get some ice cream and then go on our way. The uh, post office was there and there were only maybe eight or ten boxes because the rural routes came up. One from Three Bridges, R.T., came up through Pleasant Run and Stan and to the store, and Frank Lederat came up from Lebanon to the store, and they would eat their lunch there, feed their horses, and uh, tell the news to the people, you know, and then they would depart. Uh, three Bridges would go down the Foothill Road to, what, 31, and down to 
to uh, Woods Ch Church and Barley Sheep and back to Three Bridges and Lebanon going over the mountain back to 523 and back to Lebanon. And uh, it had the only telephone I can remember, even though I was so young, that uh, one day the trains were all blowing their whistles, you know, nobody knew what it was. And so uh, Ben Boyce found out what it was, and the thing was when the World War I ended. I can remember going out in the field and telling my father. Then in later years, the post office was where it is now. It was uh, George Barton had a, a woodworking place there, and then there was the locker plant, you know. That was the office for the locker plant, the freezer plant. And then, of course, the post office was always in the store up until it was moved to where it is now. There was an Applejack distillery down on, uh, I think it's a one-way now. You, When you come to the intersection of 523, they turned sharp to the left on going back to the mountain, and right there, that that farm on the left was a distillery. And then the first place on the right, which was torn down recently on Woodhill, Foothill Road, that was a Jeremiah Hall. He was one of my ancestors. He had a distillery there, at, uh, and they made Applejack mostly. My uncle Chester Scomp, who grew up on a farm in um, over in uh, Reddington bought the farm, uh, bought the house up on the uh, side of the hill in 1938. And he had me helping him clear out the, uh, the sheds in the house. The, the attic in the house was full of old uh, bottles and things that um, were left there by the operators of a illegal still that was conducted on those premises. When I was working for my uncle, I noticed that uh, the property contained a lot of trees, large Bing cherry trees, which I love to eat, um, and the sour red cherry trees and plums and grapevines that was used in making the moonshine. I'll tell you one thing that happened during the Depression that will give you an example. I went to school and college for one year because a relative of mine had a little money and he gave me $400 to go to school for Rutgers. And I had $3 left at the end of the year. Oh, they had a hard time. You know, during the Depression, everybody had a very hard time. If you had a garden, you were rich, you know. There was no such thing as these big stores and mega stores. We didn't have that. At Rutgers, you could find a, buy a meal for 15 cents. And uh, you could buy a meal around here for 15 cents, as far as that went. And uh, a movie cost 15 cents, you know, if you paid to get in, then you go in the side door or something, you know. This was in the depth of the Depression. Skids, the kids were coming to school, some of them with uh, pieces of a worn out tractor belt to rivet it on the soles on the shoes. And many with sandwiches with uh, lard looking uh, butter, margarine, because they didn't have the money to spend for the red pill to uh, work into it to make it uh, yellow. But uh, it was tough, you know. You made 50 cents a day, you know. And men worked for a dollar a day. That was a going wage. And, uh, but we made out, you know, it was rough. But yeah. We were all in it together, you know, and nobody complained too much. Dorothy Stickney and Howard Lindsay were our husband and wife. And it, in the 30s, they were the most famous Broadway couple there was. And he was a playwright of great stature, and she was an actress also of great stature. I never knew Mr. Uh, Lindsay, but uh, of course I did work for both of them for well, all the time they lived there, but I know Mrs. Stickney said one time in an interview that she was born in the Wild West when they still wore guns, you know, and she didn't like that kind of life. Her father was a 
country doctor, and she came east, you know, to study and for the stage and so forth. And in the course of events, she, or she met Howard Lindsay, and of course they had a very productive life together. He bought this place for her in 1935. It was his present to her. She loved it. She absolutely loved it. Uh, when she first came here, the fact that they had, this was a very provincial place, and the fact that they had two names raised the eyebrows of the locals who thought that they were living in sin. <laughs> and Howard Lindsay was uh, opposed to exercise. He grew up in, a, in Atlantic City, and his father, uh, uh, somebody who was an uh, elocutionist or a speaker, owed his money, money to his father and took it out for lessons for a young uh, Howard. And that's how he got started in this. And he wrote uh, a popular play called Life with Father, which he played the male part and she played the female part. And many celebrities came out there and visited. I can recall hearing that Rogers and Hart were there. And I know uh, Julie Andrews, she used to come down to the store and buy some stuff. I remember those beautiful uh, 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 girls they used to bring out, the, you know, the dancers and so forth. One of the fundraisers for building Stanton Grange was Dorothy Stickney did her one-woman show, A Lovely Light, um, at 100 Central High School Auditorium, but it was for the benefit of the Stanton Grange and their building program, and they made, I think, a substantial amount of money for that. They had a, a, a show in New York, which was probably something new after their life with father. And my parents got invited in for the opening night and came back with this uh, tale about all these people in there cheering and for about 10 minutes after the end. And my father made the observation that all the friends had been invited so as to make the most possible uh, enthusiastic crowd. Why have you stayed here all your life? My husband loves Stanton. I can't get him out of Stanton. Well, a couple of times he did go, we get him, got him down to Georgia and Tennessee, but he loves Stanton. It's a wonderful little bit of uh, preserved early America right here in this township. People stay in a place oftentimes because they have the availability of, of owning the homestead as well as the fact they have a great and deep love for the soil. Well, I stayed in this area <clears throat> all my life because of the dairy business that I was involved with and eventually took over and ran from my father. And uh, really liked the area, liked the farm. Uh, <clears throat> it's a nice place to live and I had no reason to move on and I've lived here my whole life. And I've lived here all my life. I've never lived anywhere else. I love Stanton, I love the people. I guess I never had any reason to leave, you know. I was born and raised here, I went to school here, and I had a business here for many years, and then when I gave that up, I went to work for the state in Trenton and commuted. We got neighbors, but they're not that close, that, but they're close enough if you need help. And we're, we know one another and we help one another out. Well, the peace that was here, you know, you could, you could grow in your own way. And nobody forced you to do anything. There were no customs, you know, that you had to do this or that or the other thing in order to fit. You know, you fitted no matter where you were. Stanton represents in the history of this very large township and of this United States um, a little village is the way we progressed in this country. The church and the schools and, and the country store and uh, uh, everything fit and it, it's just made for a good life. I don't see any reason to move. <laughs> you know, I like it. I like to be outside. I've got 14 acres. And uh, right now I'm a little bit incapacitated, but I like to take care of it, you know. Well, Stanton means the only home I ever had, and I mean, it means a lot to me. It's just a, a lovely little place. It's a little pocket of early American 
uh, homesteads, uh, colonial homesteads, farmsteads. At some time, somebody put up a sign, Welcome to God's Country. And to me, Stanton has a, uh, been a very pleasant and wonderful place to live, to grow up, uh, children grow up in. And to me, Stanton is basically, basically a, um, a quaint little place. Nothing has really changed on the outside. But we have our privacy, and it's you got good air. I mean, everyone says that's why my husband and I are, are both living so long. <laughs> it was just a nice place to live. To me, Stanton is home. It's the place I've always lived, and I have really no desire to live anywhere else. It's still my home, and you know, it, uh, it means a lot to me. It's where I hope to leave.